Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is February 20th, 2013, and um, we uh, have invited uh, a group of people to come talk about a document that's been floating around, and uh, Monica Hardy is joining us. That's great. Um, called A Bill of Rights and Principles for Learning in the Digital Age. I don't know if it's still called that. It looks like uh, some, some people are chopping some of the various uh, words of that off here and there, but that's uh, what I've seen it as, and it's a, a growing, lively uh, document um, that started a couple of months ago. Bonnie Stewart was there, I think, in Palo Alto with a group of people, or at least you signed on pretty fast. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, I was in Palo Alto. Um, in December, there were 13 of us. Um, who met for a one-day discussion initially about online pedagogy. Um, and it was kind of an odd mix at the table. Um, it was... Uh, Why yeah. don't you introduce yourself? We, we will get to other introductions too, but sorry. Go sure. Ahead. Yes. Um, I'm Bonnie Stewart. I live in Prince Edward Island, Canada. I am a PhD student at the University of Prince Edward Island. Um, I, in the Faculty of Education here, I teach sessionally, I research social media, and um, yeah. And two months and ago you were in Palo Alto, Alto. that's where I interrupted you. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I got a, um, an invitation back in September. I had been involved in MOOC MOOC in August, which was a free sort of connectivist MOOC modeled, although not done by the um, the connectivist community that I was familiar with. Um, so it, it wasn't sort of a George and Stephen and Dave uh, MOOC, and it was a one-week offering in August of 2012 um, by a group of people that I really wasn't familiar with at all. Um, but I thought it sounded interesting because it was sort of a meta MOOC about MOOCs. And so I jumped in and did a little bit of participating in that and wrote a couple of things and made a video and made a couple of connections and was, which is about as engaged as I ever get in a MOOC. Because <laughs> I very much have the, um, I, what I like about them is actually the capacity to go in, take as much as I want, and completely ignore the rest um, because it, it helps me deal with my own inner Lisa Simpson that otherwise in more traditional schooling models feels the need to do everything. Um, and I just don't have time, like many of us, to, to necessarily do everything. So, can we, can we check people on the call? How many people are in a MOOC right now? Karen is. Karen, what, what MOOC are you in? Oh, you're... Karen, introduce yourself and tell us about a MOOC. What's, what's a MOOC and what are you doing? Hi, I'm Karen, and I'm in two MOOCs right now. I'm doing a Spanish MOOC that has about 4,000 people in it, and I'm in the fourth week, and please don't ask me to say anything in Spanish right now. I'm feeling a little <laughs> overwhelmed, but I actually, in week four, I actually feel better than I felt in week one, and I'm spending... What seems to me like a lot of time on it, like probably eight hours a week, maybe. Um, and then I'm wow. also doing the learning, creative learning MIT thing, which just started and I'm spending less time on cool. so far. I will spend less time on it because I have no more time. <laughs> At some point you top out, right? Yeah, really. So, I, I mean, MOOCs are in the introduction here um, and uh, to, to some of the documents. The, the, it's been published in several different places. But one of the, so MOOCs were an important part of the conversation in Palo Alto, is that right? Yeah, it, it, to sort of, to narrow my story there, I got mm -hmm. involved in MOOC MOOC in late September, about a month after it ended. One of the people who had ran MOOC MOOC um, emailed me and said, would you be interested in coming to this meeting in Palo Alto in December to talk about MOOCs. Um, I said, sure, I would be glad to. Um, great, so I went. Uh, Audrey Waters was there. Uh, the two guys, two of the three people who had organized and run MOOC MOOC were there. Um, then there was also, it, it was essentially funded by Udacity. So Sebastian Thrun was um, at sort of the 
one of the organizers of it, but I would say that probably the key organizer was his wife Petra, who's a humanities prof. Um, and I sense that there is some discussion in their family circle about what the pedagogy of MOOCs should be. <laughs> and uh, So she had um, an interest in discussing online pedagogies and ways of trying to make X MOOCs more um, less less like X MOOCs and more like C MOOCs. Um, is everybody here familiar with that distinction that I'm drawing? I, uh, you cannot assume that people listening to this understand that. <laughs> Great. So, I don't um, so, so that rather than than particularly the top down um, talking head pedagogy, which the bigger Coursera, especially the original Coursera and the Udacity and the edX. Um, MOOCs were using through their first year, and many are still relying on, um, an interest in the kind of more networked, distributed types of work that some of um, the smaller MOOCs and more grassroots non-profit, non-business model MOOCs have been using since 2008. And so there was interest in that kind of discussion. Um, that was actual, the, the big conversation that we had was around the future of education and how online pedagogies change things. Um, yes, and Anya just said you could maybe say there are open MOOCs and not open MOOCs, and open in terms of content, open in terms, open in terms of um, essentially also their goals, right? Because one of the things that the connectivist MOOCs or the sort of smaller, more original, smaller original MOOCs were was about generative knowledge because they mostly dealt with emergent topics, and at this point, or to date, the majority of the Coursera, Udacity, edX model MOOCs, particularly the first large group of them, were all dealing with very traditional university course content with known outcomes. And there is a recognition, at least within the, the friend circles, who are the only ones that I have had any access to, um, that knowledge doesn't end with what is currently known and sanctioned. Um, Yes, they were emergent topics, but artificial intelligence was dealt with as a, these are the out learning outcomes. The goal of the students was not to go in and generate knowledge about artificial intelligence, but to absorb or receive transmitted knowledge about artificial intelligence, which is a very different pedagogical model from the ones that, um, from the small sort of nonprofit CMOOCs. So, so there was discussion about how MOOCs can even begin to deal with the fact that knowledge is going to keep changing on an ongoing basis and that possibly that whole question of generative knowledge is very important. What, what our goal was to do was to sit down and write. Um, we discussed in the morning to write in the afternoon. We ended up writing a fair amount about MOOCs. For the next month, there was some uh, back and forth in Google Docs and then a small group of the original 12 or 13 were at MLA, um, the MLA conference in January. And they sat down in a hotel room and decided that rather than try to do a big, this is everything that MOOCs are and can be manifesto, which because there's been so much ink spilled on MOOCs over the past year, um, and it's almost impossible. Dave and George Siemens and I are working on a book right now and finding it again very, very difficult to sort of do anything summative on something that changes so quickly. Um, so they decided that to take the one piece, which was the student piece, which was about originally one-fifth of the document and not a piece that I had originally worked on, um, and and take that that and actually make that the piece that we could come out with and share. So that's so, how. It wow! Came to. I, I mean, I I didn't realize the 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 introduction was going to be that complex, which is cool because right. the document ends, ends up being pretty direct and simple. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't be sorry. But um, let's uh, let's quickly go around and get some introductions. And I, I'll introduce myself first with a question. Um, and j just kind of as an example. I, and you know, I'm I'm Paul Allison, and I teach high school in the Bronx, and um, have been doing this teacher seeking teachers for seven years now. And one of the one of the things I like to tease Dave Cormier about is um, is you know, aren't we a MOOC? Um, you know, so uh, you know we're here every week. Uh, we have emergent topics uh, 
a community that uh, comes and goes. Uh, what's the difference between what we do and MOOCs? Um, is I, I think a, a worthy question, by the way. Mm -hmm. So in other words, like, so where we put the boundaries around things is, is really interesting, I think. Um, so that's <laughs> that's how I'll, I'll introduce myself. Um, Anya, would you introduce yourself a little bit, and then we'll kind of and throw in whatever you're thinking right now. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, uh, I'm a journalist. I write about. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. Yep. Great. Uh, I write about uh, the future of education, and I first got to know about MOOCs when I was researching my book DIYU in 2009. Um, and so it's been really fascinating to see them explode, I think, into the public consciousness. My current thinking about MOOCs, I'm interested in them as they have come, you know, in their sort of very mega form that they're in now with millions of people using them and with large uh, universities associated. And my theory, my working theory is that in that incarnation they are content and therefore they are infrastructure, as David Wiley says, you know, content is infrastructure. So um, I think that the MOOC, you know, sort of talking about the pedagogy of a MOOC is a little bit like talking about the structure of a textbook, because what you really have is a very fancy kind of textbook. Um, and I think that the C MOOC, or the original kinds of MOOCs, are doing something really different, and it's a really different experiment, but my argument is that that's a very high-level game that's played by very high-level players, people who are really good at learning. Um, and this is what the mass version of it looks like, and it looks really different. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Chris Sloan, introduce quick introductions, please. Well, okay. Uh, well, my name is Chris Sloan, and I am a high school English and media teacher at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City. And I'm also getting a PhD at Michigan State in ed tech, ed psych. So, uh, and I'm also teaching online classes with the people at Michigan State. And I know as an institution, that group is looking at MOOCs, uh, you know, in a, in a different kind of way, I'm sure. That's a good enough intro. <laughs> cool. Jack. Jack West, welcome. Yeah, hello everyone, and Paul, thank you so much for bringing this together, and, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to make your last one because uh, there was a SWAT team outside of my house, so hopefully that won't happen again. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm a teacher in Redwood City, California at a 2,000 student public high school. I've been teaching science there in the same spot for 15 years. Uh, pretty involved in the ed tech community and have been since the incipients, my incipients, that is, in my career. Most recently have made a transition into um, working a little bit more closely with uh, one particular ed tech company called Hapara that works with Google Apps for Education. Um, and I'll throw a question out there based on my recent read of the Student Bill of Rights for Online Learning. And since my experience is in K-12, where the MOOC isn't quite the same um, looming presence yet, that it is in, in the post-secondary environment. I guess more specific to online learning, or I, I suppose more generally to online learning and the document that we're examining tonight. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to learn a little bit more about, and since is it um, Bonnie who, who yeah. was actually there at the writing, what the thoughts were behind the very brief language around privacy notifications and intellectual property rights. So maybe we at some point can touch on that. Go back to that. Cool. Karen, you jumped in there a little bit, but a little more introduction, please. Sure. Um, I'm Karen Fastenpower, and I um, work with K-12 schools doing a lot of curriculum integration and development and um, I've recently gotten uh, involved in looking at different models of professional learning for teachers and I do a lot in the open ed space but I would say I'm not a fan of MOOCs so <laughs> even though I am doing two right now so anyway I'm interested in this conversation. And, and you're inv very involved in uh, the School of Education at P2PU and Philip Schmidt was was part of the uh, the writing of this document as well, and seems to be still a, a a big force. We asked him to come on, and he wasn't able. And he said, "You know, Karen can represent." <laughs> but anyway, 
I'll wow. pass. But <laughs> but he is um, he is one of the driving forces behind the learning creative learning, uh, which I would categorize as a MOOC. So, mm -hmm. and I'm to the extent I'm participating in that, I guess. I Do you want to finish that thought about not being a fan of MOOCs? And and you sit in you see both worlds. You see both the higher ed and the K twelve. And right. is it true, like Jack said, that it is a higher ed thing and. It's mostly a higher ed thing. There, there are just starting to be a couple people working on some K-12 MOOCs. But I think if you sort of differentiate between C MOOCs and X MOOCs, they're such different things. And I guess I would, I'm not even sure I would consider the C MOOCs exactly a MOOC. I mean, I guess part of my interest is from the work I do at PDPU, just like, how, how can how massive can you be and have anything work? And the work I do with teachers, I mean, it's very much around sort of like this environment where it's highly collaborative and, and very small group. And I don't know that that translates to massive for me. But, but curiously, the MOOCs I'm in with 4,000 people seem intensely lonely. <laughs> and one of the things I did for the learning creative learning thing is I went and set up a P2PU group for a really small group of people to actually sort of not feel so lonely. I guess I, I sort of love the small group thing at P2PU. So I would say if anybody's interested in the learning creative learning and they're not in a group where they didn't sign up before the date, all the content is open and posted. And I'll put a link in the, um, in the chat to the P2PU group if anybody's interested in that. That'd cool. be great. Thank you. So Monica, you've been running a MOOC for four years out there in Loveland, Colorado. Um, uh, sorry. Well, introduce yourself, please. Um, so, yeah, uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> I'm in, in Colorado and mostly just been experimenting um, more specifically with the intersection of city and school. Um, but pretty much what we do is just kind of lurk around smart people like you and then just try it out. Cool. And Timothy uh, from Guru. Uh, Introduce yourself and, and mention Guru's mission there, which I think relates. Go ahead. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So I'm Timothy Burke. Um, can you guys hear me okay? I've yes. A, okay. Um, I am a teacher, former K-2 uh, elementary teacher, moved on to uh, charter schools and administration. Um, I currently am studying... Uh, using a program called Scholar, the University of Illinois uh, Masters in Online um, Learning and Tech Tools. I teach a class uh, using Guru uh, at a small teacher credential program in the Bay Area called Alliant University. And my work at Guru is to support teachers taking the step into the digital side, um, exposing them to our concept of open educational resources and how they can contribute to uh, the larger world learning community by creating collections and sharing their content. Um, we, in a sense, I think, are, are one of those experiments in uh, uh, companies that kind of could be toyed or conceived as a MOOC. Um, we have an open library, which, in a sense, um, can be customized, can be copied, the content that's on there, can be customized and created and con continually built um, and added to. Jack, as a teacher, uses Guru um, by adding new content to various units. And you know, our goal, our mission, is to honor the human rights of education. We say but to level the playing field by making content for K-12 open and accessible uh, for everyone. Mm -hmm. Cool. So welcome, everybody. Um, could you know, I, it doesn't sound like we're going to solve a lot of MOOC questions tonight, if that's fair. And if it comes up again, that's cool. But maybe, it, would it be okay if we focus in on the document um, the, the, um, and kind of describe that and, and see the importance of, of this Bill of Rights and Principles for Learning in the Digital Age? Uh, Bonnie, does that sound okay? Sounds great to me. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Direct us there if you can. <laughs> You're... Please. Well, in a sense, I've, I've, I'm sorry that I end up being the person who's here to talk about them yeah. because... We did invite uh, Audrey and others, but anyway, they yeah. might get here. Yeah, go um, ahead. And I know Kathy was traveling and, uh, and yeah. you with the white shirt and the black sweater, whose name I forget. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> You'd asked a question, and I was just wondering, did you want oh, me to... Oh, Jack. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Jack. Um, do you want me to start with that? Go or ahead. Yeah. Can you just... Can you, can you specifically ask again what it was that you were wondering about? I can't hear you. We can't hear you, Jack. Maybe you're muted? Yes, I was. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, yeah, so privacy notification was an aspect of this Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. You guys hear me okay now? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And the, the language, I don't have it right in front of me right now, but there, there was an attempt to uh, speak this, this right, if you will, that students have the right to know, or to, I suppose to keep their data private, but right at the same time it was, and or I suppose to notify them about how their data is going to be used. So it was sort of ambivalent in, in that sense. And mm -hmm. I wonder what the feeling was in the group, what the discussions were that were happening, and then probably more particularly, and I wish Audrey were here to speak to this because I know she mm -hmm. knows a lot about it, what the fears are around uh, using student data with big initiatives like Gates Foundation's In mm -hmm. Bloom or the new the fears. Michael uh, and Susan Dell Foundation similar initiative. I don't know what the name of it is. And, and I, if you don't mind, I, it is a pretty short paragraph. I'll just read it quickly. It, Thank um, you. At least this version of it that I have. Student privacy is an inalienable right, regardless of whether... Mind, I, it is a pretty short paragraph. I'll just read it quickly. Yeah. Thank um, you. Jesse, you need to turn off the, the feed. There you go. Thanks. Um, welcome, by the way. Sorry. St uh, student privacy is an inalienable right regardless of whether learning takes place in a brick and mortar institution or online. Students have a right to know how data collected about their participation in the online system will be used by organiza the organization and made available to others. The providers should offer clear explanations of the privacy implications of students' choices. So, like, yeah, I wonder, is that addressed to, you know, teachers or corporations? <laughs> That's, um, when I read it, I, I wonder if it's trying to do both somehow. Yeah. I noticed that Jesse came in, and I think, Jesse, you were actually far more part of some of these conversations than I was. So I will turn that back to you about where the privacy piece came from. The only piece that um, from that that I have to add is we were coming at all of this from a perspective sort of of the uh, Donald Trump learning society idea that we are looking at all kinds of learning contexts broadly um, and if I remember correctly the initial piece about privacy actually um, may even have come from Sebastian at the table around the, in the sense that there is a lot of data you know, coming in from all of these ventures. Um, one of the things that was released on the day that edX was announced was that part of its mandate is to um, collect analytics on learning and essentially release the idea of what good online learning is from those analytics. Um, but there's a real excess of data that is a huge part of that. and it is mostly not super visible to certainly in any of the MOOCs that I have signed up for um, particularly in the Coursera model I have no sense of how my information is being used and so that was where I believe the conversation started but Jesse maybe you were present for more of it. I think, I, I, can everyone hear me? Yes, but could you introduce yourself briefly? Yes, um, I'm Jesse Stommel and um, I was one of the original organizers of the Palo Alto um, uh, event and also was one of the co-authors on the document and I'm also the director of hybrid pedagogy which is an online journal of teaching and technology um, and my brief answer to that is that I think that there was a lot of talk about how we originally towards the beginning when we were still sussing out what we were going to do there because there wasn't much of a plan for what the specific goals of the conversation were going to be it was planned very fast and the goal was for us to get a bunch of people together sort of what I call a motley crew um, of people with very different backgrounds together into a room to talk about what was what we were all seeing happening and it was really to sort of push aside what the specific outcome was going to be and think about 
all of these topics. And one of the topics that came up early on is how do we how do we see MOOCs being monetized, and how do we see online uh, sort of new uh, models for monetizing online education and education more generally. And so that's really where this issue of privacy came up, I think, is talking about um, the fact that our data was going to be the thing that was going to allow us to monetize some of these free education platforms, and sort of a simultaneous acceptance of that fact, but also a concern about that fact, and a concern about the um, transparency um, about how that data is going to be used and what's going to be done with it. So, I hope I'm not asking that too simple of a question, but what's the problem here? Is the problem that corporations seem to be taking over our our uh, adventures online, um, and we're worried about that? Yes. <laughs> I mean, is that what this document's about? <laughs> um. I mean, is it... And I know it's not what it's about, but is that the problem that we're trying to address? I think that the problem that I think that we're trying to address... Oh, sorry to cut you off, Bonnie. I'll, I'll just say something really briefly. I think that the problem that we're trying to address is, is that a lot of changes are happening really rapidly and people aren't pausing to think about how, how we're sort of venturing pedagogically into these new territories. So give me an example of that. Where, where, where is it happening too fast? I... Um, I think there's a lot of institutions of higher ed, um, particularly um, state schools are a good example that have kind of been keeping out of online learning for many, many years and sort of almost have been resistant to online learning. I'm not thinking of any specific state school here, but just um, noticing that there's a trend of this kind of resistance to online learning and then all of a sudden these schools are jumping into online learning with a gusto and haven't been doing the thinking about online learning that's been happening at community colleges or in Bonnie's house or um, at various other places. Or here <laughs> on TTT. No, but seriously, um, and, 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 and other places. You know, so, so from the K-12 perspective, what I can say the problem I see is there's a lot of, um, pro, you know, a lot of the stuff that's available for K-12 is not very interesting. Is is deadly even, um, and kids hate it, teachers hate it, administrators hate it, but we're using it um, because that's all we have. Um, and so, you know, you guys are worried about MOOCs and so forth, but we're worried about killing <laughs> kids' interest uh, because of, of the stuff that's online. Mm -hmm. One thing uh, yeah. we're from uh, the K twelve perspective, from both the teacher side and the student side, is when they create a teacher who puts all of his or her energy into creating a collection on Guru, there's some fear that the school might have proprietary ownership of that content. Or if the students are creating that content, they, they want to be able to see as well the data from who studied their collection. Um, did their friends like it? Did they answer their questions correctly? And where does that live? You know, for reading this document through, it's empowering to think that students should have the same access to their own creations as the teachers do from theirs. But there's a lot of fear to say, will I be willing to put this up publicly for others to then build off of and copy and recreate it in the way that they want mm -hmm. to yeah. One of the things that, and like I said, the, the initial piece around the bill um, and the fact that it was called a bill was a, a subject of some contention among the group. People had different approaches to that. Um, and I wasn't a part of as much of the development of that um, as, for instance, Jesse was. But I do remember there being conversations regarding some some of those questions. Right? How, how do we how do we put those things together? Um, there are all these intersections of people's roles and responsibilities. And what we were trying to encourage was both sort of a broad concept of the learner role. Um, and, and the intersection between the learner and teacher role, but also to encourage openness in practice where possible. Um, because one of the things I would say that there are certainly concerns, Paul, in terms of, of MOOCs um, in their biggest model as, and I see it increasingly over the past couple of months, the backlash 
is fairly significant as particularly faculty become sort of engaged and entrenched against what they perceive as the privatization of education and higher ed. And I, I'm very, very sympathetic to a lot of that position. I don't think that resistance to MOOCs is necessarily resistance to open learning or open, but sometimes the, the ways in which different meanings are all kind of stuck under that one word and when I say it, three different people hear completely three different things at this point, it makes it very difficult um, to pin down what we're talking about, like I had said in the, um, in the chat side. And so we wanted to foreground a fair amount of openness um, as part of anything that we were putting out to encourage MOOCs where we could. Um, our hopes was that the document document's goal was to be sort of a, a first foray aimed out at the world, do something with it, hack it, play with it, let's make it something, whatever it needs to be, but in its core principles we needed to be broad and we needed to be open. And those were really the two pieces that that I retain of most of that conversation about getting ready for the final release, Jesse. That yeah, and the thing that, like, my goal or my sort of feeling, I also wasn't necessarily sure um, about the idea that we would, I was, there was a concern for me about the perception that we would be speaking for students, and I have a concern about that. What happened for me during the event is there was a moment where I looked around the table and I thought, do we really have the Motley crew that we need here? Do we have enough, do we have a diverse enough group of students in this mix? We have... Bonnie, who is a graduate student, and then we have all of us who are students of MOOCs. Um, and when we originally were starting the discussion thinking about MOOCs, there was a way in which we could reasonably say that we were pretty adept students of MOOCs. Um, however, when the discussion broadened out, there was a point where I looked around the table and thought, we need more students in this conversation. And so really, part of the motivation of this document was to say, how can we make sure that these kind of conversations don't happen again at tables like that one and not have two to three student representatives in the group um, balancing out the other mix of people we had there? Mm -hmm. And uh, can I, K-12 teachers as well? Were there uh, any at, at that table? Because <laughs> we're here now. <laughs> yeah. Um, the truth is, yeah. a thing for me is that we need everybody. We need everybody at the table crossing, uh, cro yeah, yeah. talking across these subjects. Um, there were open education teachers, certainly, and there were, but I don't, were there any K through 12 teachers, Bonnie? I don't think I'm so. Not, not, not currently practicing, at least. I was a K through 12 teacher at one point, but I have have not been for and you know, there was a, there was a about to college that group, teacher right? there, and I thought that that was very important. To add to the mix, also. No, I mean it was a group of, of people who have essentially built names in MOOCs, basically, and so there aren't a lot of undergrads at this point who have engaged okay. and and built that kind of profile either. And I think that was probably where that came from. Um, have we been, like, there has been a lot of hacking on the document, there's been a lot of edits, a lot of changes. I Have you guys seen the updated version? Um, significantly altered in language, some international participation, which is good. What I haven't been aware of, other than certain pockets, is a lot of uptake um, in kind of networks of students. And I'm wondering if part of that is I still see, I've been watching, you know, MOOC conversations and have had a lot of pings set up for about a year now on MOOCs. And I still see most of the conversation um, among 30s, 35s, and overs. Um, so it's still a demographically semi-closed conversation. There was a good group of students from my institution who engaged in a discussion about the document and engaged in the document. But to speak to Bonnie's point, I'm at an institution of lifelong learners. So most of them fit the demographic that she just described. So as far as 18 to 20-year-olds, um, I haven't seen that demographic in the, in the conversation. Um, although I no, definitely... Again, Anya, I know you're saying... Sorry, 
and you're saying a, a ton, like millions of them have enrolled. I think that may be true. The conversations that, that I'm following around them are network conversations, Twitter conversations, blogging conversations. Those are the pieces where I'm not seeing a lot of um, voices under 30. And not that there aren't some, but they're not a huge number. Can I, can I chime in with a question, Paul? Would that be all right? Go for it, Jack. Yeah. Okay. So in reading through the document, so much of it made sense to me that, that we would want to encourage open access, that there's a, a right to public knowledge, to fi financial and pedagogical transparency, to great teachers. All of these things make, makes total sense. But I, I, maybe what I need is some more concrete examples of concerns around privacy and intellectual property rights. And maybe this is maybe this is an issue that's a little bit more salient or pertinent in, in the post-secondary space. But may, maybe you can flush this out with a, with a couple real life examples of fears or concerns or or you know what does Big Brother look like in this situation? Okay. What is can I ask what is what is your position in terms of um, I'm having trouble directing the question in the right way, but it sounds like you're feeling like that's not a concern in your world. We lost you, Jack. We don't hear you. Sorry, I clicked mute instead of okay. enable. <laughs> Go ahead. Perhaps less of a concern. Okay. Uh, but I want to be sensitive to it, and so that's why I'm asking the question. Like, what are some real, like, what's a concrete example of a transgression that could possibly happen with the use of someone's data, maybe even anonymized data? Uh, Karen gave me a good example of backstepping into actual individuals by associating them with their demographic information, and I suppose that's a concern. But so, concrete examples like that and why these two particular issues that are on the right side of privacy or notification and intellectual property rights in particular. And the, and the second one seems like a very difficult one to manage if you're gonna if you're gonna do a startup MOOC and you want it to be like you guys are saying a C MOOC now that I'm an expert on the difference between MOOCs. Um, it seems like a, an awfully big challenge to make that stuff accessible over time if you want it to that as part of it to make it ongoing data service so people can retrieve what it is that they put into a system. Um, so maybe I just need some examples. For me, at least, and again, like I said, this is, this is not my area. This is not a piece that I was particularly involved in, in driving at all. Um, but I see two broad ways to approach any kind of large group, group collaboration on the internet and one is the very closed proprietary Facebook approach where all we has is ours and every so every photo that I put on Facebook Facebook has the right to do certain things with um, all of the content that I put up there I do not necessarily know what is being collected I do not know what of my information or habits is being sold to advertisers. Um, I do not know what my rights are over my, um, in my case, on, on Facebook photos type of thing. Um, whereas, and, and part of, particularly when you are dealing with large groups of people coming to what is available to them for free, and particularly when you are dealing with, I would be perhaps more concerned in terms of the K-12 population in talking about MOOCs because you also have young people who may not be even able to consent to some of the types of things that, that would be collected. So you can have a very closed approach to that kind of content or you can have a very transparent approach to this is how we are using any data that you put on here. And so again, from my very simple look at, at those types of, um, when you are building a platform, 
we wanted to encourage a, an open and transparent so, perspective to that platform rather than some of the sort of gotcha stuff that you're seeing again with different types of content but on Facebook where oh yeah and we actually we own that now. Um, so you're not one, concrete, into, one concrete example that makes sense for me there is obviously images and the concern with the use of images of minors that they may include in whatever work that they do. Mm -hmm. So that helps. Thank you. Yeah. Or there's there was something announced just a couple of days ago. I think it was the 18th of February. There's now um, a technology. I'm sure it's you know not mainstream at this point, but I believe it's the FBI that has it. It's called Riot Gear, but Riot stands. It's it's an acronym, and it's it's a pair of glasses um, that are kind of like cyborg glasses, but it overlays your social media content from public forums. Uh, so if you are involved in, for instance, a civil disobedience altercation, um, your faces can be scanned apparently um, from video being taken of some kind of altercation and then checked against public social media files and if they find my face and I'm in some kind of demonstration then all of my Twitter and Facebook information whatever I've chose to, come, um, chose to put up publicly can then go against my face while they're watching what I'm doing, particularly you know, if, if I'm involved in something. And so as those types of surveillance um, technologies become more and more part of the culture that we're involved in, what, what kind of you know, protections, what kind of, plat what do we expect of platforms and educational providers in terms of how they approach those possibilities with their students. What if you start having, um, you know, the, the, the American history of sort of student civil disobedience and you've got people involved in MOOCs, is that content and maybe things that they've said in politics courses, is that private, is it not private? You know, those are sort of dystopian um, imaginings, but that basic approach interface of will this be closed and proprietary or will this be transparent is an important piece of the conversation. And there's really, I think, a conversation both ways, both thinking about um, the right to privacy, but the right also the right to do public, the right to do public work. Um, there's been a lot of cases lately of certain educational, um, like the case at Georgia Tech with the wikis being shut down. Um, cases where pub students doing public work has been shut down based on FERPA or based on ethical reasons or you know based on various other reasons and I think that there was a strand also in this of basically saying that we as educators and as students um, and as learners we have the right to do work openly out on the web and that that's an important key part of our learning. That which that was much more mm. the piece that, that I was invested in that's more where my own work lies and my own knowledge is. And one of the things that I push for um, is for students to develop public profiles and to begin to, to network and engage um, so that they have the capacity to contribute publicly to knowledge on a given subject. And that that really matters, that, that your teacher is not the sole audience for the knowledge production that, that you do. Um, Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I, I actually have to go, you guys, so I'm going to say a quick goodbye and, and exit out. Thank, Thank you very you. much, See you, Paul. Thanks. Thanks. So, uh, th you know, that, that's, that gets pretty, that starts to get kind of exciting, and I wanted you to keep making the case for the 18 or the 15, the 14-year-olds. I don't, I, I don't know where, at what cutoff. But um, how can we get younger people interested in, caring about um, their rights. So that, I mean, if I, I'm going to make, a, again, a very mundane kind of example. If I go into my social studies class tomorrow and I'm 15 years old and my teacher isn't letting me put my work up publicly yet, I can say, look, I have this, this, this right. This is my right to put my work up publicly, right? I mean, that's a kind of an, an exciting thing to, to mm -hmm. tell a kid. Are there other things in this document like that that would get them caring about this Bill of Rights? 
What do you think, Jesse? What do you guys think? I mean, when you look at it, there's parts of it that I'm really, really behind and parts of it that I have mixed feelings about or that I don't, that I think are, are nice, but I have no idea how one would go about enforcing them. You guys, you know, Monica, you have a whole group of students that you work with. When you see those, are there any that strike you as useful, as something you could do something with or, or use as an education tool to begin to un to unschool because I mean we we spend so much time within the system unfortunately acculturating kids to the idea that they should just be told what they're getting and thank you very much that I think part of the reason why you know it's difficult to say to a group of 15 year olds get really excited about the fact that you have rights most of them probably are like yeah whatever really they probably don't believe that they have rights because they're a lot of their interactions may not, you know, support that. I think that that speaks to just the, the sort of habit that we have, the habit that we have to sit around and have conversations like this, which are good conversations, really rich conversations. But, I mean, I think even looking around at this table, um, seven people, why don't we have a 14-year-old in this group? And I'm not to say that, like, instantly we should have a 14-year-old in this group and in every group. But I think it's interesting just to think about the sort of conversations that we create and the sort of habits we create around talking about teaching and learning and talking about pedagogy and thinking about why we don't, from the start, when we're designing our syllabi, have students in the conversation. When we're designing our lesson plans, have students designing our lesson plans. And I think many of us do do that. So I'm not saying that um, that doesn't happen across the board, but I'm saying we have a lot of habits just in our system that, that keep learners out of the conversations from the start and to the point where if we say, hey, come join this conversation, it doesn't feel genuine. It doesn't feel like there really is a space for, for them at the table. Those are great points. Um, <laughs> other thoughts? Uh, Karen, anybody? Chris? <laughs> well, I was wondering, um, you know, because I teach in a regular school, and, and I was um, kind of keying into um, the flexibility part of the document. Um, and I don't know exactly where that is page-wise, but it's down a bit. Um, and, and I guess I'm thinking, like, of the roles of things like MOOCs for the students who, um, you know, who aren't getting everything they want out of school. And, uh, you know, I know you could say, like, that probably applies to most students. But, you know, I do deal with kids who um, have real positive experiences in school, and, you know, I deal with people who don't. And, and I guess I'm interested in how the two worlds can um, perhaps coexist, because I don't see schools going away anytime, any, anytime soon. But yet, you know, like I know that some of my artists are, you know, do a lot more learning on DeviantArt, and, you know, some of my photographers do a lot more learning with their Flickr groups that they establish. And, and I guess, you know, like I, I was kind of interested in the, the flexibility um, section of the document there, just because, you know, the potential to meet more people's needs, I guess. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, I guess my one point is that the language is almost like, you know, the old gatekeepers. You know, I feel like that's kind of directed at schools. And I guess, to a certain extent, uh, some of that is deserved. But I get a little defensive of schools because I think we do a lot of good stuff there. But there's this need to do these things for everybody that doesn't always exist in the school. So yeah, flexibility. And I was reading old gatekeepers as uh, the publishers, but or the, you know the big corporations that are starting those those online education situations, um, and that we see in our schools right now. You know, I so I want to I I keep wanting to feel I keep feeling like the problem has to be established, um, like. We we need to recognize, and and kids recognize that that most of what they do on computers is deadly. is is like taking tests and working through program curriculum and just really really pretty pretty bad stuff. Um, and so, as an advocate for 
um, online education and using computers in, in w amazing freeing ways, I, you know, I want them to see, I, I f you know, are we, I, I mean, I think this document is about that crossroads that we're facing. We could go down one way and, and, and lose some of the exciting things that we can do online. Um, and I think that's the fear, if, if I can, if that can be said. And I just wonder if, if it's, oh, you know, maybe we need a document that says what the problem is. <laughs> or is that too hard to name names that way? I think there's sort of, I mean, this document is doing something right in the middle because there's two things okay. that we need on either end. We need the problem at the front, and then we also need the practices at the end, like what specific practices can we do? What specific actions can we take in order to affect some of these things? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I read this almost as um, a framing of the mindset for how to take the leap into online learning and digital learning and carrying the power back to the students as creators and co-constructing knowledge and this kind of um, you know, a set of frames for people interested but not really willing to explore that in their practice yet. Um, I think the follow-up, Jesse, of course, would be practical implementation, what it means. How do you start small with it? Because Paul, as you said, they do a lot of brutal experiences online, but yet kids still come back to it and they're, they're dire for wanting to learn online and want to engage with computers and have that experience, um, even though in a lot of things, rote testing and um, very structured uh, directed from the teacher. Mm -hmm. Nikhil, did you want to jump in here? At least introduce yourself and yeah. And help us help us think about how to get more student voices. I mean, we certainly um, do it once in a while here on TTT, but and you're one of those wonderful student voices that join us. But welcome here at the end. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so just a quick bio on myself. Um, I just graduated from high school about three weeks ago, um, and yeah. I'm based on Long Island. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm the author of a recent book, One Size Does Not Fit All: A Student's Assessment of School. Uh, which was published in September. So uh, along the lines of the, the question and the topic we're discussing about online education, I mean, I think that the, one of the most important things to remember, remember is that um, most of online education right now, unfortunately, is based on lectures. Um, it's either through somebody telling you what to do. It's either through some kind of didactic, some form of didactic. And I think... The, the problem I think the, the is problem with that is um, that we're not moving towards um, DIY, we're not moving towards uh, really project based really learning experience that are so experience. much more valuable, I think. So much more valuable, 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 I think. Um, these guys are you know, Socratic arts and they did they're working on different on uh, really changing the structure of online classes so that you create something out of it. You build some kind of product, you're working with a company, you're uh, formulating some kind of prototype. It's much more than you just answering some multiple choice questions, answering some essay questions, and getting your certificate at the end. Um, I mean, definitely you can use those resources. I'm not against that. Um, I think um, edX has really created especially some kind of community as well as Udacity and Coursera. But we've seen the dropout rates in those and the completion rates in those courses are so low um, that the kids are obvious, uh, often very disengaged with the subject. Um, I wouldn't be one who wants to answer uh, hundreds of essay questions or multiple choice questions to demonstrate my knowledge of the subject. I'm going to write an article or I'm going to reach out to somebody or I'm going to build something. Um, I think those types of experiences are much more worthwhile. Yeah, I, I would completely agree. Um, that's the piece. My name is Bonnie and uh, your book looks really cool. And one of the things that um, we were discussing earlier, a couple of us were involved in in developing this and part of the goal was to have things be more open, uh, be far less transmission. Our kind of MOOCs was that they have a lot of potential as long as they're moving towards those kinds of change and not just a business model disruption, right? right? Where you're putting glorified correspondence courses online. Um, and so there's basically a strong threat of a push for openness in intended to be in there. Um, the piece that we haven't had a chance to ask, and, and, and since you're here, um, 
what, because I, I notice at least in my sort of networked world, there's, you know, nominal, nominal diversity, but a lot of, uh, not a lot of age diversity, and not less. I know there are large networked communities um, of youth interested in learning, and like Anya said in the chat, right? They have their own goals, understandings, and norms. Are there ways that you would see to begin to connect our conversations more, so that you have, you know? one of the things that we wanted to do was break down some of those student and teacher roles and talk about being learners and everybody being learners and teachers right. but if we don't know how to build those bridges then we're not going to be fully successful in that outside of the place the classroom situations where we still have a certain amount of power so right and I think that kind of the, I think one of the major obstacles that I've really come across is having this this like you were saying this partnership where you have teachers acting more as um, acting more as um, learners rather than the person with all the knowledge at the head of a classroom, um, and I think that's something that really needs to be addressed in uh, graduate education school because in most of those institutions where you're learning pedagogy and the art of teaching and, and learning, um, you're basically told that you have all the knowledge, you should have all the commands in the in the classroom, keep control and don't let it get out of hand. Um, and I think that's one of the major issues that I'm running into because unless we change those practices, um, it's great that if we ch uh, change more teachers and help them understand their role change, uh, role shift in, in classrooms, um, that's great. But I think the structure and, the, and the, the root of all the problems in the way we're treating teachers and the way we're um, addressing learners is really, it really starts at the college and graduate school level. Hmm. Interesting. And that I, I like the idea that that suggests that it's less about telling students and learners, hey, join this conversation, and more about having educators and teachers changing the way that they enter into the conversation. I highly recommend Nikhil's book. Um, it is like the voice that we've been listening to. We've been listening to for years. Years. Okay. Okay. Um, I think kids. I think kids are that interested in rights. That interested in rights. They're more interested in doing. They're more interested. In doing. And um, so that's my out there thought. Is that can, can you say it one more time? I didn't hear it. Um, sorry. I, kids are. Uh, kids aren't. I don't think kids are that interested in in rights. There, they may be. There may be a perception that they're interested in rights right now because we're not giving them the, an abundance of choices, and so you know we give them two two choices, and of course they'll pick one. Um, but if it truly is an abundance of knowledge, I guess I guess my problem is I have a hard time after hearing all these voices. Like, why are we doing? Why why are we doing this even? Why? Why do we need this? One of the recent readings I did of Holt talked about how all the litigations um, happened as soon as school became compulsory. So if school's not compulsory, um, and I hear Dana, Dana Boyd in my head, and, and if everyone's known by someone and our filters are humans, um, I don't know, I just, I know we're trying to make it more open, and I, I know these are incredible things that are happening, but I'm wondering if that's part of the root of the problem, that we think we have to write something or we have to say that we have rights even. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just want to make one quick point. I'm, I have to eat dinner. I just came home. Um, but I, there's a really great book that I highly recommend. It just came out a few weeks ago. I mean, it, it's been out for um, decades now, but it was re-released by um, Pat Ferenga, um, John Holt's book, Escape from Childhood. So it talks a lot about, I don't agree with a lot of the things it's a little bit radical but the, the stuff on learning is spot on it's it's very it's very keen and has a lot of insights that I think would be very interesting um, to look at so it's called escapes from childhood cool Jonathan Holt right yeah cool that was really great to join you guys um, well, I'll see you around. thank you thank you and we'll have to figure out lots of other places to get you in here too Thanks. definitely um, we we should uh, kind of be wrapping up here, uh, but but I actually like Monica's question about why 
why are we doing this? Because um, and and not not rhetorically, like let's hear some actual real answers to that. If that makes if that's fair, I'll say for me the yeah, only sorry. from from my position the only real purpose to it because I agree in terms of big documents about rights, etc. There are all of these sort of networked communities of creative people who are really engaged, really trying to um, find new ways of doing things. And at the same time, I think some of the things that Nikhil pointed to were the, the tacit curriculum stuff that tends to happen more so in power relations around institutions. So when we talked about the gatekeepers, I, w I also saw it more in the, the publisher side of things, but also in, in the power relations side of things. Not so much schools, certainly not teachers, but in, in the power structures by which we get messages that school should be a particular controlled type thing, that even if an individual teacher chooses to resist that, um, we have cultural messages that are bigger than that classroom, always. And so, there are people who, in education, whom I encounter, teach, work with, and am the student of, um, who do not share these particular interests in opening things up, in networking, etc., and who perceive those things as simply directive, this is the way to go about education. And I think from my perspective, where I saw some hope or value in that kind of document was there are a lot of people in the next year or so particularly at small and mid-sized institutions, probably in higher ed, maybe in K-12, who are going to be tasked, um, often without a great deal of background in online ed, in pedagogy, to, hey, let's MOOC this. Let's MOOCify this. I'm hearing it at my own institution, right? And, and at my institution, they have Dave and I, and so they go, hey, you guys MOOC this. But we're getting phone calls from people in Ontario who we haven't talked to in 10 years going, um, I work at a community college and they want to MOOC this and um, does that mean I make videos, etc. And our hope, my hope at least, was that for people who are not engaged in these conversations that I have the privilege of being, but who are going to be tasked with building a MOOC anyway, that maybe some of the basic push for openness students are teachers, you're a learner, pieces that are part of this document might help guide an orientation to course design that keeps MOOCs from turning into the big bad privatization wolf in education. Hmm. <laughs> I think what, what happens is so many teachers in that situation that Bonnie is describing get put into a learning management system where the learning management system is actually making a lot of the pedagogical decisions for them and they don't really realize that and so there's a way in which we have to think critically about the space that we're teaching in and if we're teaching in a classroom we have to think about how are the chairs are arranged are the windows open is the door open are we allowing guests into our classroom same thing in a digital space we have to get people thinking critically about what is this interface of the computer, what is this interface of the LMS, how can I work within it, how can I build community within it, and how can I teach it to do what I need it to do rather than letting it teach me. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to throw in there, maybe it's a similar kind of thing, but let's assume that there have been wonderful, rich, conversational, uh, Socratically led, <laughs> you know, classrooms. How can we how can we reproduce that online? I mean, I don't think we have the answer to that yet. You know, I I think we're still trying to figure that out. But I, you know, so I, and I certainly that. hope we don't try to replace all of those things with online solely by any means. Um, but when we go online, when when when, yeah, when I when I see traditional. Actually, when I see good classroom curriculum go online, it's often pretty deadly. So, you know, I, there's yeah. got to be ways for it to, to come alive. Well, one thing I would say is that we use the discussion. Uh, in a lot of online teaching, people use the discussion forum almost like it's a crutch, as though it's the holy grail of online learning. And the thing is, the discussion forum mimics one kind of conversation we might have 
in a face-to-face -face scenario, but there are so many different kinds of conversations that we have from day to day and sometimes even from minute to minute in our face-to-face -face interactions. And so we have to find ways to have all of these different kinds of dynamic discussions. And one thing for me that has really achieved, the first tool I've used that feels like it has really achieved the dynamics of a conversation for me is Twitter. Um, the discussions that I have with people on Twitter, that is the one place where I feel like I've gotten in some, to some discussions that feel as vibrant. That they don't replace the discussions I might have in an on-ground classroom, but they feel as vibrant in different ways as um, on-ground classes I've led. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing I would love to see, by the way. Here are all the problems. I'd also like to say, you know, here are the wonderful thing. That, here, here's what's wonderful about dynamic interaction. And we haven't figured it out exactly online how to make that happen yet. But here are a few examples. But I think admitting and saying we haven't figured it out yet is really important. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, the corporations can't take it over because we don't know what it is. <laughs> anyway, so, well, I think uh, there's always the, yeah. the potential for subversion, you know, the, hopefully, um, of even if they do take it over. Sure but. enough. Chris or Karen, you guys have any last thoughts? Well, I, um, what, you know, just the closing language of the document, you have to come back to because really uh, it's kind of poetic down there that, um, <laughs> You know, I think we, Paul, you've mentioned deadly a lot tonight, and, and I think I that, don't you know, know why, sorry. <laughs> a, a lot of schooling can be deadly, but, you know, it ends with play. And I think that really, you know, good learning, uh, just... you know, I try to foster play and mistakes and those things uh, in the classroom. And so when, when Jesse's talking about um, we have to be careful that LMSs might lock you into certain things, Sometimes the fun just gets sucked right out of things, um, you know, sometimes in the way LMSs are just presented. And, and I think that that last little bit, you know, good learning, you know, it cultivates the imagination and, and the dispositions of questing. I think that's just great. And, and that's the kind of thing we still need to foster, whether it's on ground or, or online. So I like how that, that ended. I like that document's end. Thanks, the other thing we need is we need to think about uh, learning as being emergent, that sometimes one thing people do is they often plan a whole online course in advance as though we can know what's going to happen at the end. And the mm -hmm. truth is we have to recognize that learning is emergent and that it happens, so much of it happens in the, in the moment and is a surprise to us. And we have to let those surprises happen online and our tendency is to architecture things too much so that we don't allow for those accidents, surprises, failures, etc. And that's absolutely happening in K-12 to blended learning stuff where the entire curriculum is presented and kids just work through that curriculum. Um, so, you yeah. know, figuring out ways to keep things emergent iterative is a great, great point to make. Karen, do you have any great points to add? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I really appreciate the the idea that there's always opportunity for subversion. And I guess I would say, like, let's focus more on that and you know, maybe less on drawing boxes around things that are particularly for a future we can't even imagine what it is. I think sometimes by getting really detailed in this, we 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 create constraints that we because we don't even know what the future is going to be. So, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you know, and and the good guys will follow the rules, and the others won't, right? I mean, they'll do whatever they're going to do anyway. So <laughs> but, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, um, Tim, any final thoughts? Thanks for coming back here. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry, I've had some tech snafus. Uh, I think just really what resonates with me in the doc is that um, those those students ha having the right to teach, and then also, mm. in some sense, empowering them with this right to what we want to see at Guru is empowering them to take ownership of, of their learning pathways and, and what you do Paul with Youth Voices is an output for their work and that their work um, can influence others and inspire others and potentially inspire them months after they've created it and and that um, you know that they should be in some way taking the steps to start owning that themselves and, and pushing just as much as uh, their teachers might push them or responses they should push the teachers to think about these things. Very cool.
Can, I want to tell you, as we close, I, I want to tell you about one thing I, I, I'm playing with right now, um, a, a, making a, a student to learn, uh, a teacher. Um, his name is Ruth. He was named after Babe. Babe Ruth, um, but it's a he. His name is Ruth, and uh, he's he's finished all of his um, requirements for graduations. But he's still hanging out. He still sort of needs to be in the school until June. Um, he wants to be there, so he he comes, he hangs out, he does his own thing, and he works intensely as a music promoter for Sansato, who's a wonderful Dominican rapper, by the way. Um, and and so I, I've been watching Ruth come in every day and work for three to five hours every day solidly, great concentration, right? Uh, uh, because, and, he, and he's doing his own thing. So I, I threw on a screencast for, for two hours, and, and he and I are going through that screencast and trying to figure out all the little things he's doing Wow, you know, during that that hour and fifty minutes. So, he's uh, he's going to mm -hmm. teach me. He's going to teach me what he's been doing, <laughs> and he's fascinated to look at it too. So that's one of the things I'm playing with. Um, just that's thought awesome. I'd throw that on at the yeah. end here. Um, I hope people look at the document, play with the document. Um, there are lots of places to keep hacking and um, mm -hmm. making suggestions. It's a it's a, a generative document, I would say. Yep. Um, Fair to Hopefully. say, yeah. And um, I do want to say that uh, next week we will have Stephen Ritz here. Stephen is a South Bronx uh, gardener teacher uh, phenomenon. Ted, you know, look up Steve Stephen Ritz on TED Talk. Um, he he uh, he's a real connected teacher to the community and to uh, plants in the South Bronx. Um, and um, so he'll be on, and uh, we we are here every Wednesday night. Thanks to Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo, who um, started us off at edtechtalk.com, which is a channel of the World Bridges Network. Thank you all, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Paul. Good night. Bye, everybody. Good night. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thank you.